tonight we're going to be talking about oxalates. So, if you're not familiar with oxalates, let's, let's do a dive. Oxalates are chemical compounds predominantly found in plants. So they're, they're part of the plant component. Plants use oxalates as a part of their own defense mechanism system. So plants use oxalates to lower their risk of potential infection, to lower the risk of insects, you know, taking over, creating problems to prevent excessive calcium buildup, as well as to provide structural elements. So these are compounds, again, found naturally in plants. And we'll talk about some of those plants here shortly. But, you know, one of the highest oxalate containing plants that many people, in my opinion, over consume is spinach. And we'll talk about why again shortly. So stay with me, we're going to get to it. Now in humans, oxalates can be toxic in large quantities. And this is important to understand because many of the symptoms of oxalate toxicity can mimic the symptoms of gluten sensitivity. So toxicity levels are known to occur between four, this is a pretty big range by the way, four and 15 grams a day. Okay, so if you're doing big smoothies, like big juicing mass quantities of spinach, it, you know, it's gonna take quite a bit to achieve this level, but some people are more sensitive to oxalate than others. So, but medical research shows as little as four grams a day can actually be toxic and kill somebody. So we're not talking about even just necessarily toxicity, but we're talking about the potential for an oxalate to be able to kill you. Now, oxalates in humans can cause mineral deficiencies. Okay. So you got to be aware that if you struggle with imbalances in minerals. If you, every time you go to your doctor and your doctor's measuring your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium, etc., your levels are constantly coming back low. This might be one of the reasons why. That's a big takeaway from this perspective. Is that, again, oxalates will bind especially minerals that have a valence of two. The, the chemical structure of oxalate, it has, it has room to grab minerals that have a valence of two. So that's like your potassium and your iron and your calcium and your magnesium. So those things oftentimes low in people with oxalate toxicity. Now in humans too, oxalates can cause kidney stones. And if you've ever heard of a kidney stone, if you've ever had a kidney stone, generally they're made from calcium oxalate. So calcium oxalate let me spell that better for you. Most people think, oh gosh, I've got kidney stones. I can't use calcium. Or I shouldn't take calcium or I shouldn't eat foods with calcium. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of doctors will tell individuals, hey, if you have had a history of, of oxalate, calcium oxalate stones, they'll tell them to avoid calcium-based foods. And this is actually one of the worst things you can do because calcium deficiency can actually increase oxalate toxicity. And that's something that we don't wanna see happen either. Now, we'll talk more in depth about that in a minute. But kidney stones, the predominant type of kidney stone isolated and identified in individuals is known as a calcium oxalate stone. You can also have magnesium based stones and other stones, but calcium oxalate are the most common. And then we got crystal deposition uh, that can occur with toxicity of oxalates. What does that mean? So um, any, of, any of you ever heard of gout? Gout is a form of uric acid crystal. Well, oxalate toxicity can cause oxalate crystals. So oxalate crystals can form and those can deposit into your tissue. Now, two of the places that we'll see oxalate toxicity occur kind of more frequently is one is in the joints itself. It can mimic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, and it can mimic conditions or exacerbate conditions like fibromyalgia and lupus. So think of autoimmune arthritis. Um, again, the potential for oxalate can, can be there. But also for females, this is a big one, so the bladder itself. Um, and so if you've ever heard of, there's a condition called interstitial cystitis, which is very, very painful. 
but um, this has actually been linked to oxalate toxicity or oxalate formation, which can create extreme bladder pain. So women are more susceptible to this particular manifestation. So if, you've, if you suffer with interstitial cystitis or IC, um, you might just consider that oxalate toxicity is part of that problem. Okay, so let's moving on here. So let's talk a little bit about gluten sensitivity um, because gluten sensitivity increases the risk for oxalate toxicity. Now, aside from the fact, um, those of you, may, and so let's maybe poll, how many of you have been tested properly for gluten sensitivity tonight listening to the show and have a gluten-related issue? If you've got a gluten issue, just type in gluten into the box and let me know. But Gluten sensitivity can increase the risk for oxalate toxicity, and there's several mechanisms why. One is fat malabsorption. So this is true, especially in celiac disease. Celiac disease, one of the common hallmark side effects of celiac disease is damage to the villus atrophy in the small intestine, which leads to fat malabsorption. And remember that components of bile and fat can help to minimize oxalate absorption. And so this is one of the reasons why those with gluten issues, especially with celiac disease that suffer with fat malabsorption can actually have an increased risk for development of oxalate toxicity. We also have nutritional deficiency can increase the risk. So for example, low levels of calcium and magnesium, low levels of zinc and iron, um, low levels of vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 plays a role in metabolizing oxalate. So if you have nutritional deficiencies of these particular nutrients, which by the way, this is very, very common to see this handful of nutrients in people with gluten issues. Remember, gluten causes malabsorption, not just fat malabsorption, but also vitamin and mineral malabsorption. And so these nutritional deficiencies can increase your risk for oxalate toxicity. So again, now gluten sensitivity, aside from that, so let's just, let's just kind of draw a line here. So one of the other things that can happen is that we see is that people who maybe don't know they're gluten sensitive and they have a high gluten diet. So high gluten diet, because pretty much all of the grains, so maybe you're not grain free at this point and what are called pseudograins. And if you don't know what a pseudograin is, um, a pseudo grain technically is not a grain, but, but grains are your, your wheat, your barley, your rye, your oats, your corn, your rice, your millet, your teff, whereas pseudo grains are technically not grains, but your buckwheat, your amaranth, and your quinoa are considered pseudo grains. But grains and pseudo grains are extremely high in oxalate. And so some people that struggle with, for example, with kidney stone formation, increased kidney stone formation, um, a lot of times we'll see that the kidney stone formation will diminish going on like the no grain, no pain diet plan as a result of removing these grains, because when you remove these grains, you lower your oxalate consumption, but also when you remove grains, if you're gluten sensitive, your GI tract has the ability to heal right? And you can become what better nourished as a result of the lack of damage that gluten can cause. Now, one other thing I didn't really write down, but I'm going to kind of mention it here, is we know that gluten causes leaky gut. And so if you've got a leaky gut issue, this can increase oxalates from your gut to your bloodstream. So leaky gut can allow oxalate crystals to travel from your gut easier in directly into your bloodstream where then they can go travel through your bloodstream and get lodged into different tissues. Oxalates, uh, much like gluten can affect any tissue in the body, oxalates can affect any tissue in the body. But where again, we're, we're clinically where we seem to see oxalates really show up in a big way is interstitial cystitis and rheumatological arthritis. So diseases that, that, that look like you know, autoimmune arthritis, if you will. So let's see here. Let's move over. I wanted to show you a couple of different things. Now, one of the other things that can increase your risk of oxalate toxicity is right here is antibiotics. Now, antibiotics, why can antibiotics increase the risk of oxalate toxicity? Two, two big reasons. And you can see this, these are research studies. In this particular study, you see there's a type of, of uh, of bacteria called oxalobacter fermentinges. 
okay, or from in genes, and its potential role in human health, okay, down here what we see is that this particular bacteria is known to help break oxalates down when you eat. This bacteria lives in your GI tract. And so if you have healthy populations of oxalobacter, and this has actually been studied, people with healthy populations of oxalobacter are not as impacted or affected by dietary oxalates, meaning that their healthy guts with robust bacteria can break oxalates down and get them out easier versus if you've got a long history of antibiotics, remember with those antibiotics, right? What do, what do antibiotics do? Antibiotics can destroy or knock out your healthy gut flora. So we don't want to see that happen. So you see here, this study showing the benefit of oxalobacter. Now, another type of bacteria that helps to break down oxalate is lactobacillus. So this is a common one found, you know, if you ever make your own sauerkraut, ferment your own uh, foods, like your own vegetables, like the perfect one is sauerkraut because cabbage is a low oxalate vegetable. And when you, you know, when you ferment it with bacteria, lactobacillus is one of the main species that grows. This type of bacteria has also been shown in some research studies to lower oxalate absorption and to reduce oxalate flow into your bloodstream. Now, in this research study, you can see here the use of antibiotics Okay, and the risk of kidney stones. Well, in summary, you can see here, recent evidence suggests a possible causal role, very important, causal role of antibiotics in the development of kidney stones. Let's just highlight that for you. So this is basically saying if you are one of those individuals that potentially has taken antibiotics multiple times throughout your life, we now have Research is showing a causal role, meaning antibiotics can actually cause an increased risk for the development of kidney stones. So antibiotics are another thing that can, in a very, very big way, increase the risk of oxalate toxicity. Remember, one form of oxalate toxicity is a kidney stone. And those of you who've ever had, uh, who've ever had a kidney stone know the level of pain that that can really cause. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.